Good morning and welcome to Cross Country Church Online. Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with us this morning. Let's get comfortable and check out the announcements for this upcoming week. I am important. How he made me is amazing. I was designed for worship. My mouth establishes praise to silence the enemy. Everywhere I go becomes a perfect health zone. And with God, nothing is impossible. There's an advocate right now in heaven. I need you to know this. He's the son of God. He's holy, he's perfect, he's righteous. And you might not believe this, but he's telling the father right now, your name and his hope for you. And he's hoping that whatever struggle that you brought into this week, whatever way that you find yourself feeling shackled, that this week you'd be set free. You don't have to go this way. You don't have to go this way. And every time you make a decision that goes towards locking yourself up, I want you to know you can always return. You can always come home. You're always welcome because of what Jesus did on the cross. encourage you to check out our Facebook page for any announcements or upcoming events. You can also follow us on Instagram. We are live streaming the message each week which is uploaded to YouTube that you can share with your friends and watch from anywhere at any time. You can give of your tithes and offerings at crosscurrent.org. If you click on the more tab there you will see the giving option. You can also text an amount to 703 972 1748. Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Girardi, the pastor of community and outreach at Cross Current. Uh, so glad you could join us this morning. Um, just a reminder that today, after the service from 1230 to 230, we'll be back at Windmill Park in Ashburn for a time of fellowship, some worship and prayer. Uh, the last time we were there, it was awesome. So hope you can join us. Uh, also, I just wanted to thank you, uh, those of you that responded to the survey we sent out last week. We sent a brief survey, uh, basically trying to gather information from you guys about uh, the best options for getting back together for in-person uh, church. And so thank you for doing that. It's not too late if you haven't responded to respond because we want to take all the feedback that we can and uh, make an informed decision. So hopefully you guys will get an update about that soon. Uh, but for now, let's get ready to worship the Lord together. There is a river. There is a fountain that drowns sorrows. There is an ocean deeper than fear. The tide is rising, rising. There is a current curling deep inside. It's overflowing from the heart of God. The flood of heaven crashing over us. The tide is rising.
as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to CrossCurrent, my name is Fraser, and welcome to our series Financial Fitness. Look, if I want to be healthy in any area of my life, I have to develop the healthy habits for that area, right? So you think if you want to be physically healthy, you have to develop the physical habits, you know, eating right, exercise, sleeping, lowering your stress. You can transfer that to all the areas of your life. If you want, if you want to have a healthy marriage, then you have to develop the healthy habits of relationships. The way I talk to people, the way I listen to people, the way that I respond to problems. These are the habits that correspond to that area of your life. And so it's the same that if you want to develop healthy finances, then you have to adopt certain financial habits that are relevant to that area of your life. Now, I want to tell you right up front that at the end of this message today, that I'm going to say a special prayer uh, for those of you who are really struggling financially. We have a, a lot of people who are facing tough times because of the recession and because of COVID and loss of jobs, a lot of things going on. And so we're going to have a time of asking God to do a, a miracle in your life financially. But friends, why should God do a miracle in your life if you don't change the attitudes and the actions and the behaviors that got you in the hole in the first place? I have a phrase that I like to use. I say, God won't bless a mess. Now, the thing is, God loves to do financial miracles and he does them all the time. And I've seen many of them in my life as a pastor and I've experienced them as well. But, but God says, you know, first of all, you got to get your act together. <laughs> you got to do it the way that God says for you to do it. So in this series, we've been uh, in financial fitness for a few weeks and we've looked at a few things, right? We've looked at the fundamental laws of money that God talks about in the Bible. And we're focusing particularly on two books of the Bible, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little turn and this week and next week, we're going to look at very practical things. Next week, we're going to look at the five ways to make money work for you. The, the five best ways to use your money on this planet. And that's a, it's going to be a good message. I'm excited to share it. But this week, we're going to look at the eight habits for getting out of the hole. Eight habits for getting financially free. And of course... They're all in God's word, the Bible. And today we're actually going to take all of our verses from the book of Proverbs. Now friends, each of these habits is in order, right? I'm going to give you eight of them, but I want you to know that I've put them in the order in which you do them. So the first habit is the most important one. The second one is the second most important one, the third one, and so on and so on. And uh, so these will appear on your screen and I'd encourage you, friends, to take notes. Number one, the first thing that the Bible teaches that I have to do if I'm going to get myself financially fit is this. You ready? Remember that God is my source. Now, this is the starting point. I have to remember that God is the source of all my supply. My source is not my salary. My source, it's not the economy. My source is not my savings, but my source and my security is God. Now, the reason why that is so important is you have to put your security in something that can never be taken away from you. If what you put your security in can be taken from you, then you're going to be insecure the rest of your life. Because look, if you put your security in your salary, well, you can lose your salary. If you put your security in your job, you can lose your job. If you put your security in your savings and your investments, you can lose those. 
And by the way, if you put your security in your spouse or your health, you can lose those things too. You must put security in something that cannot be taken from you. And that is your relationship to God. And so God is the source of my supply, not my salary, not my savings. Look, if a job dries up, right? If that water faucet of supply gets turned off, God can turn on a faucet over here, somewhere else. If one door closes, God can open another door. And if that door closes, God will open a window. So let's look at our first verse together before we get into Proverbs and the practical lessons. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 18. It says, Always remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Right? God gives you the ability to produce wealth. You might circle the word produce. So I, don't, I want you to notice that the Bible says that, that it's God who gives, like He gives it to us, this produce. God owns it all. He loans it to us. We talked about this in week one, that you don't really own anything on the planet, right? It's loaned to you from God while you're here. And you didn't bring it with you when you were born and you won't take it with you when you die, but you get to use it for 80 years or whatever. But really it all belongs to God. And when you die, he's going to loan it on to somebody else after you. So here God gives you the ability to produce wealth. Now, every economy, including America, has wealth makers and it has wealth takers. It has wealth producers and it has wealth users, wealth contributors and wealth consumers. And the economy gets turned upside down when there are more consumers than there are contributors. Now, I'm not going to get into taxation theories and all this stuff, but look, when there are more people taking out of the economy than putting it in, we're in trouble. And that's what's happening right now in America. Over 50% of Americans take more out of the economy than they're putting in. We have more consumers than contributors. But God said, I made you, I designed you to produce, to create. I designed you to be a productive person. And so God wants you to be productive And his plan for your life, part of it, listen, part of it includes wealth production, wealth creation. That is part of God's creation. Now, there's a lot of talk right now, a lot of talk about some of this stuff. And this is not a political commentary, but I want to explain to you briefly the differences in how Christians view these things. The differences between communism, capitalism and Christianity. You see, capitalism says what's mine is mine and I keep it. And if you don't make any, too bad for you. What's mine is mine and I'll keep it. That's capitalism. Communism says what's yours is mine and I have the right to take it. And that's a redistribution of wealth. I can take yours and give it to somebody else. That's communism. But Christianity says what's mine is really God's and I'm willing to share it. You see the difference? This is the difference. Capitalism says what's mine is mine and I get to keep it. Communism says what's yours is mine and I get to take it. But Christianity says what's mine is God's and I'm willing to share it. So when somebody taxes you to help the poor, listen, you don't get any credit for that from God. But when you voluntarily are generous When you help the poor, when you give of your money, that builds your character. It helps you grow. It helps you to become more like Jesus Christ. And so being productive and being generous is God's way of supply. Now, don't misunderstand me, okay? God wants to provide benefits and services and protection to help the vulnerable vulnerable people in our world. And the way that happens is through creating prosperity. There's nothing wrong with prosperity, nothing wrong with prospering. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. As long as you don't make it your number one goal. And as long as you do it the right way, which leads us to our second habit. The second habit is that if I want God's blessing on my finances, is I must make money honestly. Honestly. Because God will not bless cheaters. God doesn't bless crooks. God does not bless deceptive people who steal. Now let's look at some verses from the book of Proverbs on this. Proverbs 15, 27 says, Dishonest money 
brings grief to the whole family. In other words, I can go out and make a bunch of money, but if I make it dishonestly, I'm bringing grief. It's like I'm it's like bringing a curse, bringing a problem to my family. Now, you're going to say, "Well, that verse isn't for me," because I'm not, you know, I'm not robbing banks or anything. I'm not a drug dealer, right? Okay. But are you honest in every area? Let me give you just a few things to think about for you to, to challenge your own mind. Here are some ways that are dishonest earnings. Firstly, not giving a full day's work. Look, if, you're, if you have an employer who's paying you for a full day's work, but you come late, you leave early, you take an extra long lunch break, and you waste time on social media and playing on uh, games, you're, rob that's, you're robbing your employer. Now, maybe you never thought of it like that, but they are paying you for a certain amount of work and you're expected to give that certain amount of work and it is dishonest to be paid for work that you're not doing. Another way is padding an expense account. Padding your expense account is dishonest income. What else? Misusing resources at the office. That's dishonest. Fudging on your taxes. That's a dishonest way to make money. And all of these, God says, I don't bless that. I will not bless that kind of stuff. Now look at this next verse, Proverbs 16, 11. It says, the Lord demands fairness in every business deal. Wow. So you know what that means? That means that if we're in a negotiation, I don't lie to you. I don't cheat you. Look, I don't tell you that this car is impeccable when I really know that it needs the brakes done. I don't tell you that this house that I'm selling you is in perfect condition when I really know that the pipes are broken. See, when I misrepresent something in a deal, that's dishonest. And God says, don't expect me to bless that. So don't lie to your customers and don't cheat them on the deal. Let me show you just a couple of other ways. Now, this one might surprise you. Proverbs 28 to the Bible says, if you make money by charging high interest rates, you'll lose it all to someone who cares for the poor. Did you know that verse was in the Bible? Isn't that interesting? saying if you make money by charging high interest rates, you'll lose it all to somebody who cares for the poor. You see, God's not against making interest. Now, how do I know that? Because we looked at a whole story of Jesus in the New Testament about the parable of the talents where a guy doubled his money and, the, and Jesus said, well done. So God is not against making interest. But what the Bible is talking about here is a, is a concept called usury. And usury means excessive or exorbitantly high interest rates. This is what loan sharks do, right? You know they, how they prey on people who are down on their luck, people who can't get a, perhaps a normal standard loan from somewhere else. And so they go and borrow from somebody and it's like 10, 20 times the interest rate. Totally excessive. And God says that's cheating people and it's dishonest. Okay, one other one from Proverbs 13 verse 11. And it says, wealth from get-rich-quick schemes quickly disappears, but wealth from hard work grows. You know what? Every get-rich-quick scheme sounds great. That's how they sell it to you, right? You're going to make high profit in a little amount of time at low risk, right? And they put it all, all this together and it all sounds so great. And people invest their money in this and they think they're going to beat the normal market. They're going to beat the normal ways of making money and they're going to get rich quick. And then they get duped. People lose money this way all the time. And so the Bible warns against it over and over. So I must make money honestly. Let's look to the third habit. Remember, these are in order. The third habit you have to develop is to honor God first. I honor God first with my money. Now, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this one. Most of you know this principle. It's called the principle of tithing. Look, the bottom line is this. Whatever I want God to bless, I put him first in. We talked about sowing and reaping last week. If I want God to bless my relationships, I have to put him first in my relationships. If I want God to bless my time, I put him first in my time. And if I give him the first part of every day by having a quiet time in the morning, God will bless it. And if I want God to bless my business, I put him first in my business. 
The principle of tithing, right? That right off the top, I give the first 10% back to God. That's what a tithe means. The first 10% back to God. Now, I want to show you four verses that tell us God's promise, the purpose of tithing, the place that we should tithe, and it even tells us the day that we should do it. So let's look at these four verses. And the first one is the promise about tithing from Proverbs 3. It says, honor the Lord by giving him the leftovers at the end of the month. (laughs) Is that what it says? No. It says, he will fill your barns to overflow if you give him what? The first part. Friends, God gets paid first. So if I make 10 bucks, the first dollar goes back to him. If I make 100 bucks, the first 10 bucks goes back to him. Now, listen, I may be in debt to you, but I will not be in debt to God. You see, because it all comes from God in the first place. And I want his blessing on the rest of it. So the promise is, if I honor him with the first part, he will bless the rest. That's the promise. But what's the purpose of it? Why does God tell us to tithe? Deuteronomy 14 says, the purpose of tithing is, what? Because God is poor, needs our money? No. It says the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your life. See, God doesn't need your money, but he wants what it represents, your trust of him. So when I tithe and give that first part of my income back to God before anything else It says three things, really, past, present, and future. It says, God, I thank you. I'm grateful for all you've given me in the past. I'm doing this because you're number one in my life right now. And I'm going to trust you in the future for your ongoing provision. That's the purpose of it. Now, what about the place? Like, where do I tithe? Do do I tithe to to the United Way? You know, do I tithe to to my brother who's been out of work for a year? No, listen, those are charity. Tithing is an act of worship. So the tithe goes to God. It doesn't go to my friend. It doesn't go to the local nonprofit. It goes to God because it's an act of worship. Malachi 3.10, God says, Bring to my storehouse a full tenth. Now the storehouse is the temple, or in our language today, the church. He says, Bring to my storehouse a full tenth of what you earn. And then he says, Test me in this and see that I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out all the blessings that you need. Now, this is the only place in the Bible God says, test me. In fact, he's basically saying, I dare you to do it. So we got the first three. And when, when do I tithe? In 1 Corinthians 16, it says, On the first day of every week, put aside some of what you've earned during the week and use it for the offering. But the amount depends on how much the Lord has helped you earn. See, that's why it's a percentage and not a a, a number. It's according to what you earn. So if I make $100, I give the first 10 to God. But notice it says that I do it on the first day of the week. Now that's Sunday and that's the start of the week. Because God wants the first portion of my day. He wants the first day of my week. And he wants the first portion of my income. Now notice also it said, put aside. Put aside some of what you've earned. And the reason it says that is you've got to plan it. Giving is not an impulsive thing. You know, you're at church one week and you're like, oh, how much have I got? No, you're supposed to plan this as an act of worship. And by the way, it's so easy to do these days. The easiest way to put it aside is called online giving. And you can set it up. It's super simple. In fact, even today, you can go to crosscurrent.org to the giving tab and give like there. Even a caveman can do it. I stole that from Geico. (laughs) That was a Geico ad. All right, let's go to number four. The fourth thing in order, remember, is I have to save money wisely. If I want to get out of debt, I got to learn to save. Now, I want you to notice that this is number four. And this one is coming after I give to God. It also comes before I pay my bills. Now, this is the part a lot of people don't understand. I'm telling you, and the Bible's telling you, to save your money before you pay your bills. Because if you wait until all your bills are paid to start saving, you'll never save anything. And in fact, you'll increase your bills because you keep living up to what you earn. 
And that's why so many people are going to hit retirement and have nothing because they've never saved. So the Bible says you pay God first and you pay yourself second and then you pay your bills. You say, but I've got bills to pay. Yeah, but if you save first, you'll live to what you have left. Let me tell you, John Rockefeller, who was the kind of Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos of his day, the first mega millionaire in America, was asked one time about how he became so wealthy. And he said, simple, the 10, 10, 80 principle. He said, I tithe the first 10%, I save the next 10%, and I live on the remaining 80%. Friends, if you would do that systematically, putting God first, putting some in your saving, it'll add up over time. It really will. Now, did you know that God says that your savings account is a test of your IQ? <laughs> it really shows how smart you are because if you look at your savings, you can tell how wise you are with your money. Look at this on the screen, Proverbs twenty-one twenty. It says, the wise man, in other words, the smart man or the intelligent woman, saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. Now, that's probably a verse that you should put on a post-it note and wrap it around your credit card. The wise man or woman saves for the future, but the foolish, foolish person spends whatever he gets. I was looking up some research for these messages. And did you know that the average person in Japan saves 25% of their income? The average European saves almost 15% of their income. And last year, the average American spent 1% more than they made. So we're not saving anything. So not only is the government being irresponsible, we're being irresponsible and we're not saving. And as a result, you'll get to retirement and there'll be nothing there. So let me give you a little question that'll help you start saving, right? Simple as this. Ask yourself, do I really need this item? That's it. If you just stop before you buy anything, just stop and ask yourself, do I really need this? Because you could be taking that money and instead of buying that thing on Amazon, you use that money and put it in your savings, put it in your investment. Because when you're saving your money, your money's working for you instead of you working for your money. And most people never get out of debt because they spend their entire life working for money. But when you start saving it and investing it, your money now works for you. Now, let's look at some of the principles of, of saving and investing from the Word of God. I told you this was all going to be practical. Proverbs twenty four twenty seven says, Develop your business first before building your house. You know that was in the Bible? It says, develop your business before building your house. So what does that verse mean? It means before you go and buy new curtains, before you go and redecorate, before you buy another piece of furniture or a new car or nicer clothes, he says what you ought to do is to take that money instead and invest it into something that's going to make more money for you. So build the business first before you build a house. Now, most of you don't own your own business. But in those days, everybody was self-employed. Right? Everybody had their own business. And he's saying, take your money and instead of buying a thing with it, take it and put it into something that makes more money with it. So you're investing and making more money all along. Develop your business first before building your house. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Most people, what they do is they get a raise or they get a bonus from their work. And what do they do? They spend it or they increase their living standard to their new income. But what you ought to do is keep your living standard at exactly the same level and put that extra money into your savings and investment. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. Don't go buy a new car because the moment you drive it off the lot, you just lost $10,000 and you're paying it. Listen, it's a depreciating asset, but you're paying credit on it, which means that the price of the car goes down while you're still paying the interest and you end up spending two to three times the original value of the car. This is dumb. But if you take the money that you're spending on things, and instead of going and buying you know, that big plasma screen that maybe you can't afford, what you do is you take that money and you put it in the bank, or you put it in an investment, and you let it sit there for a few years, and you watch it, right? It's this powerful compounding interest. 
And one of the things you, you can do is you can develop a sense of pleasure out of saving. Now, a lot of people, when they feel down and depressed, they want to go shopping, don't they? Because there's kind of a rush of a excitement in spending money. But you need to get that attitude and change it into saving money. Oh, I had such a great day. I'm going to put 50 more dollars in the savings. See, Ecclesiastes 11 is another advice about investing. It says, invest what you have in several different places because you don't know what disasters might happen. And this is the principle of diversification, diversifying where you put your money. Maybe you've heard the old expression, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You heard that? That's from this verse right here. Don't put your eggs in one basket. You, you, you put your savings a little here and a little there and you spread it out. Look, any money manager will tell you, this is called a balanced portfolio. And you do this to minimize risk, right? You don't want to have all your money in one thing. You don't want all your investments in one stock or in one savings account. Spread it out and minimize the risk factor. That's Bible advice. Let me show you another one. Proverbs 13, 11 says, that money that comes easily disappears quickly. And uh, beside that, I've written the lotto. <laughs> Do you know that 95% of all the lotto winners end up losing all that money? Amazing. But it goes on and it says, money that is gathered little by little will grow. And that's why I call this the little by little principle. If you'd start saving yesterday, <laughs> you'd be in a better position right away. Now, Here's the question I always get when I talk about this. Person says, but I'm in debt. I'm, all, I'm in debt. You're telling me to save, but I'm in debt. Listen, you need to start putting money into savings. Why well, I don't have much to save. I don't care how much it is. Start the habit because the interest compounds and you make that money work and it makes more money, right? Just start saving a little bit every time. Now here's a reminder. We pay God first, the tithe. We pay ourselves second, that's our savings. And then we go to the next part. It's the fifth habit that you have to develop. And it's keeping good records. We talked about savings. But this is the principle of accounting. I know this is not exciting, this part. But you have to start writing down what you spend or keeping records of it until you absolutely know where it's all going got to keep a track record of your finances because if you don't keep a track of it money just kind of walks away all right the bible says this in proverbs 21 5 it says plan carefully and you will have plenty all right if you don't have plenty you're not planning carefully and the bible says plan it carefully now i'm trying to help you i love you but i also have to speak the truth right and you don't have anybody to blame but yourself. Now you might say, but I had this emergency that came up. I know, but everybody does. Everyone has emergencies. I do too. You do. We all have them. Oh, but I got laid off from my job. Look, lots of people have been laid off from their jobs. The difference between those people who make it through and those who don't is some people have an actual plan to expect emergencies. Right? If you don't expect them, of course you're going to be devastated when they come. So this says, plan carefully and you'll have plenty. But it goes on, it says, if you act too quickly, this is impulse buying, you'll never have enough. So this is why you keep records. Because you, you need to know where your money's going, right? Listen, have you ever got to the end of the month and said, where did, all the, where did it all go? And if you've ever said that, that says that you're not keeping records and that there's ignorance of your financial condition. You've heard the phrase, money talks. Well, actually it doesn't. Money does not talk. Money walks. It just quietly, secretly seems to disappear. So you've got to keep records. And in Proverbs 27, verse 23, there's another verse about this. It says, riches can disappear fast. So watch your business interests closely and then it says, know the state of your flocks and herds. Now, why does it say that? Know the state of your flocks and herds. Because obviously in those days, they didn't have banks. They didn't even have uh, money in those days. 
the, the, the person's wealth was tied up in their livestock. And you could tell how rich a person was by uh, just looking at how many animals they had. If you had a lot of sheep, a lot of goats, a lot of cattle, you were clearly rich. And if you had a few sheep and a few, you were middle class. And if you had no, you were poor. So when he says, you got to know the condition or the state of your flocks, maybe in today's language, he'd say, know the state of your stocks. He'd say, know your assets, know your investments, know how much you've got, know where it's going, know how much you're earning on it. Keep records, know the state of your flocks and your herds. And if you say, I don't know where it all goes. That's a warning light to you. Now I want to tell you there are four things that you need to know. You say, what do you mean records? What do I need to know? Okay, there are four things you need to to know. What I own, what I owe, what I earn, and where it's going. If you don't know those four things, you're already in trouble and you don't know it. You got to know those four things. What I own, what I owe, what I earn, and where it's going. This is the principle of accounting. Proverbs 23.5 says, Your money can be gone in a flash, as if it had grown wings and flown away like an eagle. That's a pretty descriptive picture, isn't it? Your money, he says, if you don't know where it's going, it's just going to fly away like an eagle. Now, fortunately, the United States government... It's kind enough to remind us of that by putting an eagle on every dollar bill. (laughs) So when you look at the dollar bill, you can see this one's going to fly away unless I tell it where to go. All right, number six. This is the sixth habit. And remember, these are in order. The sixth habit is I must plan my spending. I must plan my spending. Now, this is one of the eight habits that you do to get out of debt and to get financially free is to plan the spending. And can we just be honest? Most of you don't plan your spending, right? You don't have a plan for your, you just spend whatever you want to spend, whenever you want to spend it, however you want to spend it, and you're pretty impulsive about it. So what am I talking about when I say planned spending? A plan for spending is called a budget. Right? That's all a budget is. A budget is planned spending. Everybody needs a budget. It's a plan for how I want to spend it. A budget, listen, is telling your money where you want it to go rather than wondering where it went. And you need a budget for your spending. Friends, telling your money where you want it to go. This month, I want this much to go here and this much to go here. Rather than wondering, where did it all go, right? Budget. If you want to get out of debt, you got to nip it in the budget. Proverbs 21.20 says this. Proverbs 21 says, stupid people, which is nobody that's watching this video right now, but stupid people, it says, spend their money as fast as they get it. Oh boy. That's impulse buying right there. If you don't have a plan, here's what happens, right? You go into the grocery store (laughs) and if you don't have a list, if you don't have a plan, if you don't know what I'm going in the store to get, I'm coming out with 10 things that I didn't plan to get. Especially, listen, if you go shopping when you're hungry, right? Big mistake. And then there's one word that makes impulse buying impossible to resist and it's the word sale, right? Look, all of us, we're probably all PhDs in impulse buying. Because everything in our society tells us, you know, to have it and to have it now. And they play on our emotions. Now, during the next two months, November and December, all the advertisers and all the stores have been planning all year to get you to impulsively buy things that you'd never buy any other time of the year. Just stupid, stupid stuff. It's just a waste. Or even nice stuff that you can't afford, you know, but it's impulsive. You see it and you want it, right? Now, can I, for me, when it comes to impulse buying, it's called Costco. <laughs> I go in there and I, I don't need a hundred pounds of rice, but look at the price. What a deal, right? Look at me. I don't need five gallons of shampoo, but look at the price. It's so cheap, you know, 
I don't need a barrel of jalapenos. <laughs> but two years later, it's still taking up space in the refrigerator. Jalapenos, they've turned purple, but you've saved a lot, you know? So when somebody tells you, look what I saved. No, you didn't save anything. You spent. You didn't save anything. That money could have gone into the bank, into savings, into investments. Now it's sitting in a jalapeno jar in your refrigerator. <laughs> but you bought it of an impulse buy or because it was on sale. Have you ever bought anything that you later regretted? Absolutely. Of course you can. Because you do it without thinking. And so a budget is planning your spending. Proverbs 21.5 says, Plan carefully, you'll have plenty. But if you act too quickly, you'll never have enough. And then the next verse, verse 5 says, Good planning and hard work leads to prosperity. But hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Aren't you amazed how many verses are in the Bible about this stuff? Okay, let's get to number 7. The seventh habit is set up a re repayment plan. If you're in debt, you're not going to get out of debt automatically. You're not going to get out of debt by accident. You're, you're going to have to have a plan to get out of debt. And the only way you're going to get out of debt is by setting up a scheduled repayment plan. Now friends, you didn't get into debt overnight. It took a long time to get in the mess that you're in. So you're not going to get out of debt overnight either. It's going to take maybe even some years. But I want to tell you, and I make no apology for saying this, that as your pastor, and this, if you're part of this church family, this flock, this fellowship, my goal for you is that you will become debt free. I want you to get out of debt. But this will not happen without some discipline, without making tough choices. And I don't want you under tension. You know, as your pastor, I don't want you under the tension of financial bondage. It'll mess you up and it'll ruin your relationships. But listen, to get out from under that, it'll take five years off your life. It'll, it, it'll mess you up big time. So we want to help you get out of that. The Bible says this in Proverbs 3.27. It says, don't withhold repayment of your debts. In other words... If you're in debt to someone or to some store or to your credit company, he's saying, don't withhold it. You need to be paying that. You need to be paying it down. And the Bible also says in Romans 13, 8, let no debt remain outstanding. Now, again, I'm just trying to help you be real practical here. Do you know what that means? What an outstanding debt is? It's when you're paying interest payments only. So if you're watching this right now, if you have an amount on your credit card and you're not paying that credit card off every month, but you're just paying the minimum, then you have an outstanding debt and God says, that's no good. Because you're paying interest on interest on interest, which is dumb. And the thing that you bought, uh, you're paying for that now two, three, four, five times over because you're paying interest on your interest on your interest. So the outstanding debt is when you're not paying down the principal or you're behind in your payments. And that is a recipe for disaster. Friends, set up a repayment plan and start working to get that debt down. And here's the eighth habit, the last one. And this is kind of the bookend. And it's this, commit it all to God. I guess I must commit it all to God. Now remember, the first habit is to realize it all comes from God. And the eighth habit is to commit it all back to God. And that's where I say, God, my life, my time, my relationships, my money, my future, my job, it's all yours. And I'll do it your way from now on. Not my way that's messed up, but your way. Look at this verse on the screen, Proverbs 16, 3. This is a promise. And it says, if you commit your work to the Lord, your plans will succeed. Succeed. And I want you to succeed in life. I want you to succeed spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and I want you to succeed financially. So it says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Your biggest problem is not debt. Debt is a symptom of a deeper problem. 
It's a symptom of dissatisfaction, a lack of contentment, right? They have to have more to be more happy, I have to have more to be more secure, to be more light, to be more valuable. None of that is true. And the older I get, the more hopefully mature I've got, the wiser I get, the more I realize how little it takes to be happy. It doesn't take a lot. You know, when I was young, I used to think it takes this and this and this to be happy. If I can get all that, then I'll be happy. No, nope. you're as happy as you choose to be. Happiness is a choice. If you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy in 10 years either. If you're not happy now, you're not going to be happy with the 10% increase in your earnings. Happiness is nothing to do with that. It's all choice. So friend, you don't need it all. So I would suggest that after watching this video, you make a list of all the things that make you happy that cost you nothing. Make a list of the things that make you happy that cost you nothing. And enjoy those things. Watch the sunrise, play with your children or your grandchildren or whatever. Because the problem is not debt. The problem is unmanaged life. Unmanaged life. Your life lacks discipline. And as a result, you're drifting and you're being driven by forces, including economic forces, instead of being directed and driven by purpose and knowing where you're going. So as I begin to wrap this up, you know, one of the major problems we have today is people go out and they buy things they don't need with money they don't have. And then they spend all their time hustling, hustling, hustling to make the payments on stuff they don't need with money they didn't have. And they spend so much time trying to pay their debts off that they don't actually enjoy the life that they've already got. So look at what this verse says about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It says, if God gives us wealth and property, and he lets us enjoy them, we should be grateful and enjoy what we've worked for. For this is the gift from God. Right, here's the way. He says, God's given you some great things and you should enjoy it. But most people, you know how they, they use their money, whatever I said, they do the same things over and over again. There's five of them. Can I take two more minutes and explain this to you? The first thing people do as soon as they get money, they go out and spend it, right? They don't even plan it. They just go out and spend it. Then they worry about the fact that they don't have any money. <laughs> then they try to pay their bills, repayment. Then if there's any left over, and there isn't, they save it. And then maybe if there's any left over after that, They'll give it. That is not God's plan. That's not the order. God says, first, you recognize that I'm your source and your security. Then you work honestly for a living. You give the first part back to me. This is the order. The first part to God. You give the second part to yourself. That's your savings. Then on the remaining 80 is how you spend but you spend it on purpose with planning. You get all that? You may say, well, I can't live on the rest. I can't live on that 80. If I was to give 10% to God first and 10% to savings, I can't, it's not enough. Then you're living beyond your means. It's that simple. And you need to make tough choices. Next week, I look forward to sharing with you five principles on how to make your money work for you so that it produces more in the long term. But right now, can we bow our heads and let's pray together. Father, you know the stories behind each of these people watching right now, your sons and daughters. And some of them are kind of upside down on their house. Some of them are out of work. Some of them are barely getting by. So together right now, Lord, as a church family, every person watching right now, we pray together for our family, for those who have this need, that you'd replace their tension with trust in you, that you'd replace frustration with a feeling of freedom, and you'd replace debt with deliverance. Oh Lord, help them. Help them get out of this hole and to find a path to financial freedom. Lord, we're asking you 
for miracles. And whether the economy turns around or not, we're asking for some personal recoveries. So Lord, do what you can do as each of them does what they can do. And I pray, Lord, for these people that they would put into place these practical steps, that they would trust you and that they would begin, even if it's for the first time, to give you the first portion of their income, knowing that that invites your blessing on the remaining part. Help them to start saving and to realize the importance of that long-term investment and then to adjust spending to live on the rest. Lord, it's amazing that all this is in your Bible, your word. And so we believe it to be true and that these principles will work. And we thank you for it. I pray a blessing now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hey, thanks again for joining us this morning. I hope you got a lot out of that message. I know I did, and I know I need to work in my budget for sure, and uh, a little less time uh, on Amazon. But uh, hope to see you at Windmill Park later today, and uh, have a blessed day. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Jesus is waiting, God so loves.